Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Ian Leslie. Ian is an author of books on human behavior, and he also writes about psychology, culture, technology, and business in many other publications. Today, we will speak about his latest book, Conflicted, How Productive Disagreements Lead to Better Outcome. Ian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Alan. Very nice to be here. So, Ian, I wonder if we could start a little bit um, with you telling us a little bit about your background, what is your story, and how do you get into this love relationship with writing, especially about psychology, culture, technology, all these things that you write about? Ah, well, my I, I came to writing relatively late, at le writing as a career anyway. So my first career was in business. I worked in advertising um, for a long time, and I still work in advertising, uh, albeit in a slightly different way. Um, but I was a strategist uh, for ad agencies and uh, sometimes clients directly um, in London and in New York. Um, and then I, I got to my sort of mid thirties and I had a, uh, premature midlife crisis, which I recommend. I, I, I think everyone should have their midlife crisis early and, and often probably, um, and just thought to myself, well, this is really interesting and fun because it is interesting. You're basically working out, you know, what can we say to people in order to get them to change the way they think or feel or act. Um, and that, that, was, that specific part was my job. That's what a strategist does, is trying to understand the audience and the messages um, and then work out how to, um, how, how to create ideas which, which help them uh, do what you want them to do or feel at least you know, change their attitude to something. So yeah, it's super interesting, but then I thought, well, do I really want to do this for, for, for the rest of my life? Um, are there, aren't there other things, other lives that I want to lead as well? And I decided that I wanted to, to try and get a professional writing career off the ground because I'd always enjoyed writing. I always thought I was reasonably good at it. And, um, and, and since then, I have combined a career as a writer and a journalist um, with a uh, career as a consultant in, in advertising and, and communication more generally. Um, and it's gone pretty well. It's actually been a great life change and I have more of a kind of portfolio career, but the writing is at the center of what I do. Um, and, as, and, and it was a natural progression from my work because I've always been interested in human behavior and, and how it changes and how people can, can, can persuade people or convince people to do things. Um, and, and so the books I've written have all been about human psychology, human behavior. Um, my first book was about lying, perhaps appropriately, since I worked in advertising. Um, it was about de deceit and self-deception. That was called Born Liars. My second book was about curiosity, the trait of curiosity. And that book is called Curious. Um, again, all kind of of a, of a theme with, with what I've you know, how I've lived my life, really. And then, yeah, this book is about another aspect of human uh, nature, which is uh, disagreement. And I just sort of asked myself, why do we find disagreement so stressful and so difficult? Um, and and when, we, when we get it wrong, why does it go wrong? And, and when we avoid it, what's happening there? Like, what's the costs of avoiding disagreement? Um, so yeah, as I'm sure we'll, we'll get onto that's, that's what this book is about. So if we change career, let's say you change careers uh, on your thirties, where you thought that maybe, uh, becoming a writer would be a better route for you. That means that, uh, it's never too late to become a writer. <laughs> I guess there are some yeah. well-known authors that decided to be writers later on in their life. So that gives hopes for the rest of us who like that. Uh, enjoy the craft of writing but never seem to be good enough or be educated enough or have enough life experience to be able to share them on a piece of paper or a screen i don't think it's well i wouldn't say it's never too late but i, I think you have i think you could be a lot older than than me and and still 
start. Um, I think it's actually easier now than before because I actually think the internet has made the world of publishing and, and journalism more uh, porous um, than before. And you can find ways in, you know, it really helped me that I, I started writing a blog first of all, and then I, and then I, I started, I was on Twitter and that. So, so those things kind of helped me get into, get the attention of other journalists and writers. And I gradually grew a, a reputation. So yeah, I, I think, I think you can do it later in life. By the way, there's a great um, British novelist. She's, she's dead now, but she uh, is one of the kind of great post-war British novelists. Um, and she's called Penelope Fitzgerald. And she started writing novels in, uh, in her 60s. Basically, after she, she, she was a teacher all her life. Started writing novels in her 60s. Um, I wrote kind of eight or nine of them. And, and basically, you talk to any great British novelist and they'll all say she's just one of the best novelists ever lived. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you can, you know, <laughs> you, you shouldn't give up hope. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Well, uh, when you were working in advertisement, I can see why you wanted to be able to influence people to act in one way or another, in, uh, behave in one way or purchase an item or, or, or whatever. But then you made that as one of uh, a, a very fundamental part of your life. Why is it important to you now that you are not in advertisement to still have the capacity to influence people and the way they think and behave? Yeah, good question. Although, although I, I actually ended up, see now, now I think it's, I, I, I'm less interested in trying to influence people than I am in understanding how the process of influence works because I'm actually interested in how I am influenced. Mm -hmm. Uh, it by other people as well as how I can influence others um, and I'm slightly suspicious of people who say I'm going to tell you how to influence people because um, that kind of thing that can be used for, for, for darker purposes <laughs> um, and I also think it puts you the influencer kind of one step you know puts you in the know it puts the other person slightly below you like oh this, this is a person that I'm going to influence mm. I'd rather be in the position of somebody who says, I think it's really interesting how we influence each other. So this agreement, the book is about disagreement, for instance. It's not about um, how can I win this argument? Um, it's not about how I can persuade somebody. It, it overlaps with that. But a, 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 definition, a, a disagreement, a good disagreement, almost by definition, is one where you allow yourself to be influenced slightly by what the other person has to say. If that's not if that's not true, then it's not really a, a disagreement. It's just you trying to win an argument, um, and it's a zero sum game. You know, either you win or you lose. Um, my book is about how can we have disagreements where both parties come away, or all parties come away thinking that they've learned something or they've gained some some insight, um, and that's a, yeah, that's a different kind of a game. Okay, so let's go deeper into the subject of the book. Your first section was why we need new ways to argue. So first of all, what are the old ways to argue and, why, and what are the possible new ways that we could use to argue and to show our disagreement with other people? Yeah, so I think the, well, the old ways to argue are really what I was just talking about, which is we tend to think of argument as a zero sum game. Um, uh, if you think of the word debate, it usually sets up in your mind, you know, literally a debating competition, debating society, where people say, right, I'm going to stand up and give all my arguments and I'm going to try and destroy your arguments. And then at the end of the day, one of us is going to win, one of us is going to lose. Now, there's some value in doing that. It can kind of hone your ability to, to, to make reasonable arguments. Okay. But it's 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 competitive and it's at the expense of collaboration um i would like us to think about disagreement at, i would like there to be a way for us to disagree which isn't about whether or not i win or, or you lose that doesn't become a struggle for dominance that isn't essentially about some sort of a power relationship playing out but it's one where um, we can all walk away thinking we've, we've all gained something from here, right? We, we may not even have agreed, um, but we have uh, learned something from the disagreement. 
Um, and actually, I think there's plenty of examples, and I talk about them in the book, but we just don't have the language to, for thinking about that. Whenever we talk about argument, we, it just comes, it feels hostile, and it feels like there's some sort of um, clash uh, of interests going on. And that's not necessarily the case. So um, I'd like to just kind of change the way we think about disagreement, because I think the benefits of it are just absolutely immense. Okay, that makes sense as you say it. And I want to believe that. Uh, but, you know, like a few, a whole bunch of arguments come to my mind that I don't see how they could be settled in a, in a productive way. Let's say the current issue of uh, anti-vaxxer. Okay, so I believe in the vaccine. My neighbor doesn't believe in the vaccine. So it's either you take a vaccine or not. So in my view, well, if you don't take a vaccine, it's dangerous for everybody else. The anti-vaxxer says, well, you know, you uh, whatever the argument is, and I, fi uh, I find uh, I, I have, I'm having a hard time finding the middle ground where we can both learn from our arguments. So uh, in a situation like that, how, how can we uh, turn it into a positive argument? Well, I think first of all, you have to decide what your uh, aim is, what your objective is in the conversation. Um, and if, the, if, the, if your objective is to persuade the other person to take the vaccine, you might be setting the bar too high, certainly for one conversation, right? Okay. Um, but if, you're, if your aim is uh, maybe reframe the, the, the objective so you can say to yourself, I would like to have this conversation because I'd like to find out a bit more about why people don't want to take the vaccine. You know, and, and we kind of assume that people who are against vaccines uh, is, uh, are, maybe we assume that they are victims of conspiracy theories or, or, or they're kind of, you know, just mad, um, <laughs> whatever. Um, well, I'm sure some of them are, but, but actually people don't take the vaccine for a whole host of reasons. Some of them reasonable, some of them not reasonable. And maybe from talking to your neighbor, you, you'll, you'll get a richer sense of, of, of why people do it. And then if your job is to persuade them and others to take the vaccine, if that's your kind of mission, you'll be better equipped to do that once you have a better understanding of your audience, in effect. So at the very least, a good disagreement, an engaged disagreement, gives you a better uh, understanding of the audience that you're trying to persuade, you know, to change their behavior, whatever it is. If you never engage in a disagreement, you say, well, there's no point. Uh, I'm not gonna talk to them because I just think they're mad then you just stay, effectively, you stay inside your bubble and they stay inside theirs and, and um, no progress is made. Right. Okay, so another argument that you bring in your book is how conflict can bring us closer. And still, I, I find your argument uh, logical, but still, as I see the world in Twitter and the politics, I, I see, uh, yeah, yes, Yes, politics itself, <laughs> it doesn't seem like we are getting any closer. It seems like with time, we're getting more and more divided. And, uh, and maybe the thing is that we are not having an argument in a constructive way that allows us to know each other's um, position. But we also, in, in, like in politics, the politician has to show to his followers that he's standing strong and fighting for those arguments. And the same politician in the other side has to show the same thing to his followers. So they don't, they don't get to talk to each other. They get to talk to their audiences and it feels like they are drifting apart as opposed to through dialogue and argument to get into, find some common ground. Well, exactly. That's partly why I wrote the book. Um, although, you know, I, I don't expect to kind of solve the problems of, of global politics. Um, my, my book is really m more about um, us, you know, um, how, how, we, how we disagree with each other at work, um, how at, at home, um, and to a certain extent in the public sphere too. Um, I think part of the reason that we get put off disagreement, I, and, and we're, we're always a little bit scared of disagreement, but we, we're put, up, put off it more than ever now because we see so much toxic disagreement happening 
in politics and on so social media. So we have even more reason than ever to say, well, I don't think I want to get into that. You know, there's no point expressing my conflicting point of view here because it will just become a toxic, um, terrible argument like the ones I've seen. Um, and actually, the, the, the biggest problem, I didn't start, when I started off writing the book, I thought the problem was all these toxic fights that you see on social media. But after a while, I began to think, no, 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 that's just well, the, the, pro the problem that we see. That's the visible, that's the tip of the iceberg. Actually, the real problem is that we avoid disagreement when we can. Mm -hmm. um, most people uh, find it stressful. They fear that it will damage relationships. They fear that it will make them look bad at work, you know, uncooperative somehow. Um, or they don't want to see their team kind of argue because it seems sort of unproductive. Actually, all these things are completely wrong. You know, when, it, when a disagreement is done right, it's, it's incredibly productive. Um, it, it, you're much more likely to reach a better decision, to find insight. And actually, it's good for your relationships, as you said. You know, it actually strengthens the bonds between people. When you don't disagree with someone, whether or not it's your, whether it's your partner, your, you know, if you're in a couple, or, um, or at work, when you don't disagree with people, that's bad for the relationship. Right. When you're always avoiding disagreement, you're always nice to each other. You're always passively trying to say, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely fine. That might work for a while, but it's actually incredibly corrosive. And I saw that again and again in my research when I talked to relationship scientists, when I talked to organizational psychologists. They, they would say, look, uh, all, all our research shows that when people don't have their disagreements out in the open, it just the, the differences just become submerged and they they kind of they eat away um at, at at the at the relationship from from underneath hello hello the couples or the teams who disagree a lot and who are quite open about it um tend to be much healthier and much happier right okay i do like that part that you mentioned that a conflict makes us smarter and I, I can see that almost every day every week I have dinner in my place with some friends and our goal is to disagree about something and whenever we disagree about something and we get into constructive argument it feels first of all we feel smarter because it forces us to think and it goes closer those are animated healthy conversation. So I, I am 100% on this conflict make us smarter, I guess, in a small nuclear um, uh, friendly environment. Yeah, I mean, and, and you, you know, there are two mechanisms at work there. Number one, um, because a disagreement tends to evolve, involve you, you get motivated to be in it, right? Once you're in it, you, you want to think of all the reasons and you want to, and so, and so you're, you raise your own game, right? You raise your performance level and you do think a lot harder. And so that's one mechanism in the, that, that's making you smarter. And at the same time, what's also making you smarter is that the others are doing the same. Mm -hmm. And you're learning from them, right? So, so you're, you're learning some, some good arguments for the other side and, and some bad arguments too. And you're all collectively learning, you know, what are the good arguments? What are the bad, bad arguments here? Um, and that raises the collective intelligence of, of the whole group. Right. And one more, uh, one more subject about uh, your book, uh, Conflict Inspires Us. How uh, can you just share with the audience how we get inspired by conflict? Well, you know, what, what is creativity? Creativity is, uh, it's combinations, right? It's, it's putting different ideas, different bits of knowledge together and creating something new. It's two plus two equals five, right? And in any um, disagreement, you're generating a lot of ideas and a lot of opinions and a lot of insights. And in a really creative disagreement, some of those things meet and, and clash and fuse and become something new. Right. Um, and so w w when you look at creative collaborations, they are essentially creative disagreements. Right. And I, I spent uh, uh, quite a lot of time studying rock groups um, for the book um, because a rock group is essentially like a little organization. It's a little startup. You've got these talented, uh, somewhat egotistical people coming together. They all have their specialisms, um, but they all have different opinions on the music and, and, on, and on how to, uh, what, on the career of the group. And the really successful groups are the ones that harness those dis disagreements. 
the successful groups are not the ones that high five each other all the time and say, you're great, you know, let's have a hug. <laughs> Those ones tend to fail. Um, the, the, the successful ones are the ones where, like Jagger and Richards or Lennon and McCartney, you know, where they harness their differences and, 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 and that's what they use to, to create amazing new music. Okay. Um, um, you also bring, of course, the same idea to to a couple, a healthy relationship is one where one doesn't continuously rubber stamp the opinion of the other one, but also bring tension to the relationship. And I guess the trick is to bring that tension to a level where it allows both of them to grow and without growing so much that it uh, tears down one person or the other one. Yeah, it's interesting because you see these, you'll see, you know, these common themes that are true of a couple are also true of uh, a group or a team and indeed of a whole society. There should be some sort of tension there in, in the relationship, right? Because tension is, is creative in some way. Um, and yeah, there's some fascinating research in uh, the science of, of romantic couples where they used to think that, that a successful couple is one that basically avoids heated arguments and, and rows and, and always kind of very calm and, and reasonable. And there's now this growing body of evidence that says, no, 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 that's not true. The couples who are quite quick to rise to argument and, and actually have quite regular or, or kind of frequent um, heated rows are actually more likely to be happier um, and more likely to feel like they're making progress on the problems mm. that they do have and more likely to, to stick together. Um, you know, unless you have your arguments out in the open, it's like we were saying earlier, they just become submerged and they, they, they kind of corrode the, the relationship. Um, and and that, so the successful couples are the ones that just say, hey, look, this is how I feel about this. And basically, in an argument, you're learning about what the other person really thinks and really feels. As one psychologist put it to me, conflict is information. Mm. Okay, I live in, in Canada, in Montreal, and um, in our society here is so multicultural. Like I had a picnic last night, uh, yesterday with friends, and everyone was from a different nationality, different culture, different way of thinking. And you talk for a minute on, on something called high context and low context communication. So I wonder if you could, and well, in my situation, because we are all from different backgrounds, we are in a low context communication, but I wonder if you could just share that idea of high context, low context communication with the listeners. Yeah, so it comes from anthropologists studying different national or regional cultures. But actually, I think it can apply within countries as well. It can apply to all sorts of situ situations. So some countries have high, high context communication. And what that means is everybody in the country or everybody in the room shares the same set of cultural norms um, and they don't therefore they don't have to say much in in the conversation everything is oblique everything is understood without me having to explain it you know what i'm saying right um, and so this is more true of, of asian cultures more true of uh, um, china or, or japan than it is in the West, right? In the West where you have, generally speaking, um, more diverse and more individualistic cultures, you can't just rely on everybody knowing what we mean, right? You can't just rely on the cultural norms. You have to say everything out loud. You have to speak your mind, right? Um, and in those cultures, um, there's more conflict, right? Because you're hearing everybody speak their mind and give their opinion. Um, and you're realizing they don't think the same as you. And you're not all guided by as strong a set of cultural norms. Um, so so there, you don't have that background context of culture. You have to kind of say, so that kind of low context, um, high conflict culture is more typical of Western situations. But here's the thing, and this is the thing I think was, is, is really interesting, is that the whole world is becoming more low context, including, including China, including Asia. And, and a large part of that is, is to do with the internet, um, it's to do with the way our economies have developed as well. But the internet is essentially a low context culture, right? You, you don't know where that, 
who that person tweeting at you is from or um, you, you don't get context on who that person emailing you is. You just see the words on, on a screen. Um, and so we kind of have to write and spell and say everything out. And that can create a lot more uh, misunderstandings and, and, and also a lot more conflict. Um, in, in our days, um, companies, uh, organizations, governments are having a bigger push for diversity and inclusion. That means bringing people who are different from us to the table and maybe that fits into what you call low context communication because now we have to spell things out verbally word by word to make the other person understand exactly what is it that we need is no no longer a, a nod and a wink it's just like no do this because of x so i wonder if you have uh, any input on whether that uh, diversity and inclusion is improving our communication in a corporation or organization or is decreasing it well, I think it ultimately makes it harder. But that, I mean, that's not a reason not to do, not to be more diverse, right? We, we, we're diverse for, we're becoming more diverse for good reasons and for, you know, socially important reasons. But we have to recognize at the same time, it does make it harder to, to communicate, right? So if you were in my country, uh, England, you know, in the 1960s and you were running a bank, you could be pretty sure that all the people around the table would be from the same cultural background as you. There would be white middle-class males, um, probably went to about two schools be between all, you know, 30 of them. Um, and so a lot of what was said was, was unspoken. It was high context, right? You, you say, oh yeah, I understand what you mean. I don't have to spell it out. Now we live in a world where you, you'd be running the same bank and you get this incredibly kind of global diverse set of people around and you can't rely on that. You have to spell everything out. You have to, to speak your mind if you really want to be heard. Now, the problem is because we put such a huge emphasis, because we're so nervous, I think, about diversity, even as we, we embrace it, we put this huge emphasis on getting along, on cooperation, on respectfulness, on being nice and so on. Now, look, I like being nice. I like being respectful. I'm not against those things, <laughs> but I do think that we are now under under emphasizing the role of direct disagreement and conflict um, in you know in unlocking the benefits of diversity you know you have a very diverse set of people sitting around a table and they all just nod along and agree with each other you're not getting the benefits of, of diversity mm -hmm. so I think you need disagreement to to get those opinions out and, and to have that kind of creative ferment that, that I talked about earlier well this is a uh, uh... A topic to do more research about so I will suggest my listeners to check out your book I wonder uh, Ian if you could tell us one more time the title of the book and where can people follow you and you also have done a podcast uh, or are you still doing a podcast as well uh, no I'm not doing that podcast so, so, so but I'll tell you where to follow me so so the title of the book is conflicted uh, how productive disagreements lead to better outcomes and yeah, it's just a kind of guide to how to have more productive, uh, better disagreements. Um, and then um, I'm on Twitter at Mr. Ian Leslie. And um, I, I have a newsletter called The Ruffian, where I discuss lots of different things. But quite often I, I'm talking about disagreement and communication generally. Um, so, um, so join up and uh, see you there. Okay, all the links will be in the show notes. Ian, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Alan. Really enjoyed it.